Hello, and welcome to The Excerpt. I'm Dana Taylor. We eat for a variety of reasons, most importantly, to sustain life. Unsurprisingly, the decisions we make about what we consume can have a huge impact on our health. Equally important is how our bodies eliminate the waste created by what we ingest. After all, what goes in must come out. Are there hard and fast rules about what constitutes a healthy, let's just say it, poo? Sean Gibbons, a microbiologist at the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle, now joins us to discuss what bowel movements, or a lack of them, reveal about our health. Thanks for joining me, Sean. Thanks for having me, Dana. I think we all have an idea about what's normal for us, but how often should we be going? Is there an ideal frequency? There's no hard and fast ideal frequency, I would say. Currently, clinically, there's a wide range that's considered healthy. Um, everything from you know three times a week to three times a day is considered fairly normal. Um, and that's that's very wide. But based on what we'll talk about here soon, um, I would say maybe once every other day or a couple times a day is probably where you want to be. That's kind of the Goldilocks zone. You conducted a study last year that gave you insights into the effects of having a regular or irregular bowel movement and that effect on our gut microbiome. First, how many people took part in this study and how were they categorized? So this was a large cohort of individuals from a scientific wellness company called Aravel. Uh, and we had, you know, approximately three to 4,000 people in this cohort. We filtered down the number of people who were a part of this particular study by looking at those who were the healthiest among them. Um, so we got down to maybe you know, 2,000 or so people who had no reported diseases, whose clinical chemistries like their LDL cholesterol and their insulin resistance were all in the sort of healthy range. So these were as healthy as we could find. And what did you learn regarding frequency and our gut microbiome? Let's start with those with high level frequency. So those who had a, you know, a high bowel movement frequency, which is you know maybe four or more bowel movements a day, which is classified as, as diarrhea, they showed signatures of stress on their liver. So their liver enzymes were out of range. Um, they also saw higher levels of inflammation. Uh, and this isn't perhaps that surprising because we know that you know, we produce bile that's excreted into our bowel. And if we um, are experiencing diarrhea, we actually lose a lot of our bile through defecation and our body has to work hard to produce more of it. Uh, and that puts strain on the liver and uh, inflammation has long been known to be associated with um, diarrhea as well. And what about those who experience low frequency? Yeah, so those who are on the low end, which is, you know, three or, or fewer times per week, kind of constipated individuals, um, they showed a rise in microbially derived metabolites in the bloodstream uh, from the fermentation of proteins. So microbes fermenting proteins into these molecules like creosol or endoxol or uh, phenylacetate. Uh, and many of these molecules are toxins to the kidneys, the liver, um, and even to the brain. Um, so these are, you know, not necessarily that good for us, and they've been linked to chronic diseases. What are some of the underlying conditions that our bowels may be warning us about? Yeah, so one of the main reasons we, we embarked on this study is that there are all of these associations out there between several different chronic diseases and bowel movement frequency. So for example, those who have um, neurological conditions like Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease, oftentimes before they get diagnosed with these diseases, they have had maybe decades of chronic constipation. So constipation tends to precede these things. Similar for chronic kidney disease, we see that constipation often precedes the disease condition, but no one really knew whether that was correlation or causation. Um, is, is it just a side effect of the disease or is the constipation perhaps a driver of disease etiology? And so that's why we focused on these healthy individuals because these folks were not sick. This is before any disease has manifested itself. Um, and yet, we're still seeing the sort of metabolites and risk factors associated with these diseases elevated in the bodies of these people who are experiencing aberrant bowel movement frequency. We've talked about frequency, but what can you share with us about the Bristol stool chart? It's a way of kind of measuring frequency by eye. 
So it's a scale between one and seven, where on one end you have uh, watery stools, diarrhea, and on the other end you have dry, hard pellet kind of stools, which is on the constipated end. And in the middle, you have the nice, smooth kind of sausage texture to the stool, which is where you, you want to be, essentially. It's a way to kind of measure water content and transit time uh, just by visually inspecting your stool. As you know, two people can consume the same meal and experience vastly different results. What are some of the things that impact the amount of time it takes for food to make its way through our digestive system? And why is gut transit time important? Yeah, it's very important. And, and it's a bi-directional communication between our bodies and our microbes. So first of all, the amount of dietary fiber we consume affects transit time. Um, it keeps the water content of stool high, it has more bulk, and it promotes the production of uh, short chain fatty acids. So microbes in our gut prefer to ferment dietary fibers into these organic acids, which are healthful for us. Um, and these acids actually promote the smooth muscle contraction of our bowel and promote faster transit through, through the gut. Um, but if stool remains around for too long in the gut, microbes start to exhaust those fibers and they switch to the next best thing, which is protein fermentation. And protein fermentation gives rise to these molecules I talked about earlier that were associated with constipation, um, like phenylacetate or endoxyl or picreosyl. And so we know that microbes, when they switch to this fermentation process, they're giving they're producing these molecules and you know in our in our study we find that these molecules are elevated in the blood when you are constipated and, and that, that's where they're coming from and i guess finally uh, i'd say that um, microbes are capable of producing human neurotransmitters uh, and these neurotransmitters can interact with our um, gut uh, nervous system uh, the gut is one of the most densely innervated organs of the body. Uh, and these interactions with these neurotransmitters can also affect motility and contraction in the gut. Are there other factors such as lack of sleep that can impact our digestive health? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of work I think that needs to be done still in this area, but it is known that um, travel, long distance travel on airplanes, for example, can give rise to transient constipation. Uh, so that's, that's a well-known factor. Um, there's also traveler's diarrhea. People can often catch a, a bug when they're traveling somewhere and that can induce uh, differences in their transit time. And then, you know, shift workers, people who have disrupted sleep patterns or abnormal sleep patterns, um, their, the, the schedule of their, their dietary intake, their eating can be somewhat different from the normal meal times that most of us experience. And this can affect these, these processes we're talking about organic acid production, protein fermentation, constipation, diarrhea. Um, so we know it, it does affect things, but um, I think more work needs to be done to understand it better. What steps can people take on their own to improve their rate of frequency and hopefully the health of their gut microbiome? So in this population of people we were studying, we had questionnaire data about their, their lifestyle. We found some perhaps unsurprising things. So for example, those people who were in this Goldilocks zone of pooping, they tended to eat more vegetables and fruits. So eat your fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, they also tended to be more hydrated. So be sure to drink plenty of water that helps with, uh, with motility. Uh, and they had higher levels of activity. They, they were wearing Fitbit trackers so we could track how many steps they were taking. So, you know, between diet, exercise and hydration, uh, these simple factors can help improve your bowel health. And when should someone seek further guidance from their doctor? What are a few of the things that should not be ignored? Well, if you're experiencing chronic bouts of constipation or diarrhea, you should talk to your clinician because these could be underlying conditions of other problems in your body. But bowel movement frequency itself isn't often um, monitored that closely by clinicians. Uh, however, our study, I think, points to the fact that maybe that's the future, right? Maybe uh, the future of medicine should include this as a parameter that we pay closer attention to. Because even though we haven't causally proven that, you know, the rise of these metabolites in the blood due to constipation will eventually lead to something like a neurodegenerative disease, um, it seems likely that that could be the case. And that, you know, by having long-term levels of constipation or diarrhea, we might be increasing our risk for chronic diseases. So it might be, it might be very important to pay attention to it uh, and to, to keep in that Goldilocks zone. 
What about colonics? Some people swear that they're the gateway secret to healthy digestion. Do you have a take on that? I don't have a strong take on it. I, again, I'm, a, I'm not a clinician. I'm a PhD, so I can't give medical advice. And I don't have a lot of data on colonics, so I don't know a ton there, other than uh, it is the case that people who are getting a colonoscopy get the functional equivalent of a colonic right there. They get cleaned out before the procedure. And what we find is in people who, who take Miralax or, or have themselves cleaned out, it's a window of opportunity for opportunistic pathogens. So we'll sometimes see that people are colonized by organisms like uh, Clostridioides difficile. Uh, even if they don't get sick, they're sort of benignly colonized by these things in these windows of opportunity when their commensal microbiomass is, is depleted. Uh, and then it can lay in wait to a future date when maybe you take antibiotics uh, and your microbes are again disrupted and this pathogen can look around and say, oh, now there's an opportunity to cause disease. But long story short, I think colonics, uh, I don't know exactly what the health implications are other than they might be windows of opportunity for these pathogens to invade. Sean, this isn't an easy subject to broach, but you've dedicated your time and expertise to this study. Why does it matter? What would you like people to walk away from our conversation with? I guess I want people to think about their microbes. <laughs> you know, the the microbiome, it's it's a fairly emergent field. It's about 20 years old now. Um, and we're just beginning to understand how to manipulate our microbiota to, you know, optimize our health. And while, you know, the microbiome, you know, doesn't have a super, super strong effect on human health and disease in the short term, it seems to be critical for our long-term health and, and longevity disruptions to the composition and the functionality of our microbiota are associated with many chronic diseases like we were discussing earlier. And, you know, if you're not paying attention to your microbes, if you're not feeding your microbes with the kinds of things they like to eat, like dietary polysaccharides from plants, they'll start eating you, right? They'll eat your mucus layer, uh, which will thin and cause inflammation. You'll get constipation. And all of these factors can, can potentially increase your risk for things like diabetes or chronic kidney disease or neurodegenerative disorders. So to stay healthy throughout your lifespan, um, you know, feed your microbes. One of the reasons we embarked upon this study um, is the student working on it, Johannes Johnson Martinez. He had family members who had suffered from neurodegenerative disorders, uh, in particular Parkinson's disease. And I myself actually have an aunt who passed away a, a few years ago and, and suffered for many years with Parkinson's disease. Uh, and so we were we were interested in understanding, you know, what factors could give rise in the long term to these these types of conditions. And for both of our family members, these these individuals had suffered from chronic constipation for decades prior to the disease diagnosis. And this was a clue to us as to you know what might be driving disease in the long run and why we wanted to look in a cohort of healthy people to understand, you know, is this just correlation or causation? Right, is, is bowel movement frequency actually a risk factor in the long run for these types of conditions? Sean, thank you so much for being on the excerpt. Thank you. Thanks for watching. I'm Dana Taylor. I'll see you next time.